bless you all and we're so glad that you are here with us today welcome to life church of orange welcome to god's house welcome to an opportunity to come and fellowship with the living god as well as with one another the body of christ and so god bless you for being with us here today we're going to worship the living god here this morning and what does that mean to worship it means that you're putting everything else aside. It means that it's not about you today. It's not about you. It's not about what, what you're dealing with in your life. Right now, it's about coming to worship the living God. Yes, you will be built up. You will be built up when you worship the living God. You're going to be built up as you hear the word of God today. But what we do at Life Church of Orange is we prioritize Jesus Christ as Lord. We prioritize 
that we love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, and all our strength. All our strength means I'm going to lift my hands to God. All our strength means that even in my soul and my emotions, I'm going to love God. In my mind, I'm just going to focus on Him. I'm going to meditate on Jesus. I'm going to see God in my mind. He's seated on the throne, and the King, Jesus, He's at His right hand, the high priest, the living God. So I'm focusing on God. I'm not focusing on my brothers and sisters right now next to me. I'm just focusing on Jesus. I'm focusing on God. And I'm saying, Lord, all blessing, all honor, all glory, all power is yours. I'm yours. Say, I'm yours, church. Say that to the Lord. Say, Lord, I'm yours. I'm yours. I don't belong to myself. I belong to you, Lord God. So let's worship, church, in that heart. So, Father, here we are, your people, your church, your body, your sons and daughters, Lord God. And we come to worship you. We stand before you in worship, in praise, magnifying you, Lord God. The rocks are not going to cry out in our place, Lord God. No one's going to shut us up. But, Lord, we're going to worship you with all that's inside of us and love you with all that's in us, Lord God. We magnify you. Holy Spirit, have your way in us. Have your way. Have your way. Not our way, but your way. And we ask all of this in the mighty name of Jesus. Church, we agree. We say amen and amen and amen. Praise God. Lead us out here this morning.
watch the giants fall. Oh, fear cannot survive when we pray you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Come on and lift Forever him high. Lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we pray you. We'll see you, we'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Oh, fear cannot survive.
God, and we are in alignment with our words, singing the word of God, and that song of faith, that rises up to heaven. And then what happens? It silences the enemy. Come on, it silences the enemy. It's that weapon that conquers. It's our weapon that conquers all the enemy and everything, the anxiety, the fear. Come on, you believe it? Let's sing that chorus again. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. We'll see. We'll see you break down every, every wall. wall. We'll watch the giants Yes, we will. Oh, we cannot survive when we Come pray. on, the God of breakthrough. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him up with all creation cry, God. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Oh, fear cannot survive when we yes. pray you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him up. With all creation cry, God, we pray you. Oh, we praise you, God. We pray. This church praises you. Oh. you Jesus thank you God you know the words of this song it says we'll see you break down every wall we'll watch the Giants fall fear cannot survive when we praise you the God of breakthrough is on your side every one of you the God of breakthrough the God that we serve is with you he's for you so what, do we, what should we do? We should forever lift them high, right? What did that bridge say? It said that this is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. Let's, let's go back to the last song. I want to go back into this bridge because you guys didn't convince me that this is what heaven looks like. <laughs> and if you didn't convince me, that talks about faith. What does it say? It's impossible to please him without faith. Right? That's what it says. That's what it says in my Bible. I don't know about you guys. So whatever you're going through, what we do is we praise him because he is the God of breakthrough who's on our side. There is no fear. There is no hurt. There is no turmoil. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of Jesus. Amen? There's nothing that can separate us from the God of breakthrough. So what we need to do, we need to, this is what living looks like. This is what freedom looks like. And this is what heaven sounds like. All of the angels are rejoicing. So what we're going to do is we're going to praise God. We're going to sound like heaven in this room this morning. Can we lift this up? Can we bring this up one more time? Can we give our praises to God this morning and believe that he is the God of breakthrough? Whatever's going on in your life, it doesn't stand a chance up next to God. It does not stand a chance next to the God of breakthrough. So we're going to sing this. This is what living looks like. Here we go. This is what living looks like. This is what, come on, sing it in faith. This is what heaven sounds like. Oh, just forget about whatever you're going through. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. Oh, come on, sing it louder. This is what living looks like. This is what come on, Jesus. Feels like. This is what heaven oh, sounds come on. like. Lift it up. We, we praise you. This is what living. Come on, somebody get excited. This is what heaven sounds like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. Come on, sing it out. Oh, sing it in faith. This is what heaven sounds like. Oh, come 
on, we'll see you break down. We praise you. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Oh, we cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Hallelujah. Come on and lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, 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 oh. oh when we sing it all just falls away. Church, keep praising them. Oh, come on, this is the sound of heaven. Oh, we praise you. Oh, this is what we do. This is what we do as believers. Oh, we praise you. Oh, even in the turmoil, he is worthy. Just say, I receive we breakthrough. breakthrough. In the name of Jesus, I receive breakthrough right now. In the name of Jesus, I receive breakthrough over every circumstance. Right now, by the Spirit of God, He's imparting breakthrough. He's imparting grace, which is an empowerment. He's imparting strength to you, wisdom. Right now, whatever you got going on, I just say, I receive breakthrough. I receive breakthrough. I receive breakthrough, Lord. I receive breakthrough in the name in the name of Jesus by the power of the Spirit. Yes, God. I receive it. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I believe. You I believe and I receive. I believe and I receive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
worship you. We worship you, uh, the hope giver. We worship you, Jesus. <coughs> There's no darkness in your eyes. There's no question in your mind. God. There's no 
taking back the cross, oh yeah, love it. No regret in what it costs, he wanted to do it.
The name is on your name. Every other throne is on your throne. Every other kingdom is on your kingdom. You are high lifted up. I just need to point something out. Spirit of the Lord just said, when you feel that heaviness, that is another kingdom trying to raise itself above his kingdom. And that's demonic power. And we don't give in to that. As believers, as the body of Christ, we don't surrender to that kingdom. Amen? Is that true? That's true. That's, that's true. right. We don't surrender to that demonic kingdom that tries to put oppression on us, to put heaviness on you, to put doubt in your head, to put despair in a spirit of heaviness. And it says, when the spirit of heaviness comes, we put on the garment of praise. And so that's what we did earlier. That's what we've been doing this morning is we've been putting on praise. And it says right here in, these, in this song, every other kingdom is under your kingdom. And so we renounce that demonic power. We don't agree with it. We don't agree with doubt. We don't agree with unbelief. We don't agree with oppression. We don't agree with the spirit of heaviness. We take it under authority, under the authority that Christ has given us, and we cast it out in the name of Jesus. So let's sing this again. Every other name. Every other name is under your name. Every other throne is under your throne. Come on. And every other kingdom is under your kingdom. You are high. You are high and lifted up. Hallelujah. Every other power. And every other power is under your power. Every other glory is under your glory. Yeah. Every other spirit. And every other spirit is under your spirit. You are high and lifted up. Oh. You are high.
everybody, every other name. And every other name is under your name. Every other throne is under your throne. And every other kingdom is under your kingdom. You are high and lifted up. Oh, every other power. Every other power is under your power. Every other glory, yeah. Every other glory is under your glory. Every other spirit. And every other spirit is under your spirit. You are high and lifted up. to worship him on your own, in your own song, with your own words, with your own voice. That is who God is. God is holy. God is love. And 
experiencing what's happening here this morning is God is with us. So that means the holiness of God is here and the love of God is here. So when you have the holiness of God, we're all convicted. That's why Job said, I have seen you and now I'm ashamed of myself. But it's the love of God that leads us to repentance. See, church, this is why many times you might invite somebody to come to the house of God and they want to come. But yet the day of, there's all sorts of reasons of why they can't. Has nothing to do with me or Becky or Jordan or the worship team or any of the leaders or anything. It has to do with the Spirit of God. Is here because we welcome God. See, God's presence is here. He's with us. But He's here. And this is why we have to understand that the holiness of God and the love of God, that's, that's the same God that we worship. See, His holiness, that's why we lift our hands to Him. That's why we don't come before Him. That's why pride can't stand in the presence of the living God. That's why conviction of sin comes upon us because of the holiness of God. And it should drive each of us to say, Lord, we're not worthy. It's what made Peter say to Jesus, get away from me, Lord. I'm an evil man. it's the love of God where God said I'm going to die for my creation so that way they can have a way to have relationship with me and to be able to walk in holiness why the word of God says be holy just as God is holy So I believe what the Spirit of God was wanting us to understand here is going forward, church, we got to understand what holiness requires and also understand what the love of God, the door that's been opened for us. We can't take these things for granted. And this is what we do here when we come before God in worship, in receiving communion. And I want us to do this, church. Let me read to you here from the Word of God in this moment of worship, in this place. Word of God says this, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But here's what's important. But let a man or woman examine themselves. And it says, And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. You see that there? It's not a refusal. That's the love of God. The love of God says, but examine yourself. Judge yourself. Judge yourself in this moment. 
before the holiness of the living God and before the love of the living God. And say, Lord, here's my life. Here's my life. You see it all. You see who I am. Everyone belongs to God. But without Jesus, there's no way to the Father. There's no way to the Father without Jesus. There's no way to the Father. There's no way to right standing. There's no way to righteousness without Jesus. So Lord, as your word declares, let us examine ourselves right now. Just lift your hands, church, to the Lord. Right now. Father God, we judge our own hearts. We judge our actions. God, forgive us of the things that we commit. Forgive us of the things that we omit. Just begin to pray to the Lord right now, church. Just begin to judge your heart before the Lord. worship you, Lord. Lord, we worship you. Worship you, Jesus. Worship you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
church, the Word of God says that God resists the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. Resists the proud of heart. He resists those who are proud in heart. What a statement in God. What a statement in God. someone to say I don't feel God I don't sense God well the truth of God's word is under because that's pride and when we're in that place that means that God is resisting us that we in our prideful state This is how we know that we're right with God. This is how we know. Because we come before him with a humble heart. Would you take the communion elements? Take the bread. Here, after judging ourselves before the living God, Isaiah says, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted as though he had done something to himself. And Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. This is why I always say that I, my sins put Jesus on the cross. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and it says the chastisement for our peace was upon him he suffered so that we we would have peace and it says by his stripes do it. 
as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So let us drink it. Thank the Lord for he's done for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you. Grateful hearts. Grateful hearts, Lord God, we come before you. Lord, thank you for your holiness. Thank you for your love with us always, but especially in the significance of this moment, Lord God. For some of you, this is a moment that's going to change your life. For some of you, the light of God has hit you in this moment. power of the resurrection operating in your life new faith new faith if you believe in you'll receive it in Jesus name amen 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 times we come into God's presence we find ourselves undone this is what Job declared that's why he said I've seen you and I have abhor myself the goodness of God his mercy his loving kindness Yet in all of this, there's the holiness of God, the love of God, the holiness of God, the fire of God. Right? Our, the word of God says, our God is an all-consuming fire. That's why when Moses asked God, he said, show me your glory. He said, no man can look at me and live. but he puts him in the cleft of the rock. He's protected. And then God only shows him his backside. But yet that was enough that Moses, in God's presence, would, would shine to where the people of Israel asked him, please cover yourself. It's too much for us. And see, and this is the point, church, is that God gives us an opportunity to say, Lord, I want everything that you would let me have. Or we can allow our own fears to limit us. You're too holy, God. I'm too evil. Amen. Worship team, thank you. You know, can I just get right into the word here this morning? We'll, we'll do announcements and we'll receive the tithe and offering, tithes and offering later. Well, you know, here in God's house, right? You, you either came to give today or you're not. what it really boils down to. You either prepared or ready to give or you're not going to give, so. Amen? It's, it's not an accusation. It's just a reality. If our hearts are softened before the Lord, we're, we're glad to do all that we can because he gave it in the first place. So be blessed. His promises are sure. And he provides. He's faithful. So let us do good in that. 
Amen. But let's get in the message here. Let, let's, let's get into what the Word of God tells us. Romans 14, 10 through 12. And I think it's important for us even in this moment right now. And he says this. Why do you judge your brother? Or why do you show contempt for your brother? We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us, hear me, so then each of us shall give account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this. Underline that in your Bible if you can. Resolve this, church, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Amen. Holy Spirit, help us understand. You're the teacher. Give us understanding. Let us be good ground. According to your word, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen. So there's a question here. Why do we judge or criticize one another? Judging or criticizing in this context is different than what the Bible addresses concerning judging fruit. You ever, you ever heard someone say, well, I can judge fruit? Absolutely. But the Word of God says, stop condemning your brother or sister. Now, for context, let's look at Matthew 7. 15 through 19. It says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. This is what Jesus is saying. This is what, when Jesus talks about judging fruit, he's talking about false prophets, people who claim one thing but live another way. They claim that they have God's word, but they're actually wolves. And they're ravenous. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit. What is he saying? Every good tree bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. An orange tree bears Oranges, it's good fruit. But a tree that bears poisonous fruit, that's bad. A good tree cannot bear good, bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. So context is important as we're reading this passage here in Romans 14. Understand what Jesus talks about. What is the measurement when, when we're looking at others, our brothers and sisters? Do we just not like the way they behave because we're uncomfortable with it? Because we don't know them? And so we criticize them? And this is what the Word of God is addressing. But see, the importance here is to understand what God's word is saying. Why are you judging your brother or sister? Why are you criticizing them? Why are you putting a stumbling block in the way of unity in the body of Christ? Again, Jesus says, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, neither can a bad tree bear good fruit. A person's actions are a better measure of their motives. We can measure others by the fruit of their lives. If you say you live one way, but your actions say otherwise, well, then this is bad fruit. And this is where you say, if you're, let, let's, this, let's say this is you, and you acknowledge, you know, bad fruit's coming off of me. That's where we come before the Lord and we repent. Lord, I want to be a good tree. I don't want to bear bad fruit. I don't want to be a bad tree. I repent, Lord. Have mercy upon me, and I repent before you. 
if, look, this is a warning to us, church, of the fruit that we bear in this life. And it should be fruit that's useful to the Lord and glorifies him. If you're a Christian, a follower of Christ, you're going to bear good fruit. That doesn't mean that you don't make mistakes, but it means the fruit that remains is going to be good. Let me say that again. It doesn't mean that you're perfect. It doesn't mean that you're not going to make mistakes. It doesn't mean that you're not going to miss the mark. But it means that the fruit of your life, what people are going to see in you, it's going to be good. See, this is why God many times exposes things in our lives. The light comes if there's areas of darkness and exposes these things. And here is we see this reminder in the word of God. A, a couple weeks back, we looked at Romans 13, 9 through 10, says, For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet or, or lust. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. You remember when we were going through that? If you're following Christ, then he is truly leading you. You're not going to commit adultery if you're following Jesus. You understand me? If you're following Jesus, he's not going to lead you into adultery. If you're following Jesus, he's not going to lead you into murdering someone. If you're following Jesus, he's not going to lead you to steal from somebody else. He's not going to lead you into bearing false witness. He's not going to lead you into lust or coveting or covetousness. Because that's not where the light of Christ is going. Do we understand that, church? So if we are following after works of darkness, who are we following? And this is where the word of God has to be clear to us. 1 John 1, 6 through 7 says this, If we say that we have fellowship with him, with Jesus... That, that's what, what we're doing. When we confess Christ, when, when you tell someone, I'm a Christian, this is what you're saying. When you say you're a Christian, you're saying that I have fellowship with Jesus Christ. Does that make it plain and clear there, church? So if you say that you're a Christian, that's what you're saying. And the Word of God says this. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. And do not practice the truth. If I say that I have fellowship with Jesus, but yet I walk in darkness, I'm a liar. The truth isn't in me. And this is where I have to come before the Lord and I need to say, Lord, I repent. I claimed you, but I'm really walking after my own ways. I'm really letting my selfish nature lead me. I'm really following the devil instead of following you. It says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. But now, if you say, Lord, I'm following you, though. Yeah, there's, there's things that, that, that are around me. Yeah, there's trials, there's temptations, but Lord, when the temptation comes, I'm running to you. That's walking in the light. See, walking in the light doesn't mean that you don't have any temptations. That's not what the Bible teaches you. That's not what the Bible teaches us. Temptation isn't sin. It's giving in to the temptation that's sin. But if you're walking in the light, guess what? 
when those temptations come, you're going to be able to deflect it by the power of the light, by the power of the Spirit. This is why the Word of God tells us, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. This is why, as we've been talking about with James, submitting to God, resisting the devil and he will flee. It's the first by submitting to him. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another as well because we realize that our hearts are open with one another and we have agreement with one another. And we're both going through the same thing. We're all going through the same issue of life. Instead of thinking, well, no, I'm better than them, so I can't go down to their level. Or worse, they're better than me. I can't make connection with them because I don't want them to see what's going on in my life. Amen? But we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So we stand clean before God. The holiness of God and the love of God. And you say, that's where you acknowledge, Lord, I'm holy because you made me holy. I'm only holy because of the power of the Spirit of God working in me. And it's, I'm strengthened because of his love. I know he's not going to let go of me. He's not going to give up on me. So that means I don't have to give up. But here in Romans 14.10, this is literally is saying, why do you condemn your brother? And, and that's what I want us to understand here. Condemning. Condemning. Why do we condemn? The, the idea to condemn someone is to judge them as not being a Christian because of what he or she does. It's only God who can righteously judge us. Okay? It's only God. That's why the Word of God tells us that we should judge ourselves. And there's a difference between measuring the fruit of someone's life as opposed to not judging your brother or sister as Jesus commands. Matthew 7, 1 through 3 says this, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Lord, help us. This should convict our hearts. The words that we speak when we tear down our brothers and sisters in Christ. This should convict us to say, Lord, have mercy on me. That I would criticize my brother or sister in Christ just because they're different than I am. Not because they're sinning, but because they're different than I am. Because they go about doing things differently. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Doesn't gossip breed out of that when we talk about others, about their speck? And the whole time we have this plank sticking out of our eye, hitting everybody, right? Because gossip infects, right? It, it infects. You could have somebody that's, I don't want to hear any gossip. I don't want to do anything with gossip. And then you, you bring, that other person brings gossip to them, and all of a sudden they're gossiping. It's infectious. Jesus commands us as family to not judge each other or criticize each other, especially for things that are not sinful. Stop looking at the speck in your brother's eye while not considering the plank that is in our own eye is what Jesus says. Furthermore, in truth, many who complain that they are judged by others are typically the ones who themselves are guilty of doing the judging. Think about someone who is very critical. Usually they're the ones that say, oh, people are so judgmental. 
Or you might hear them say, oh, you're judging me. Stop judging me. But they are the very ones who are guilty of doing the same judging. Isn't that interesting? But that's the truth of God's word. This is what Jesus says. Judge not that you be not judged. So in these matters, we should humbly judge ourselves and remember that it was our sins that put Jesus on the cross. 1 Peter 4.17 says this, church, For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? That it says, if it begins with us first, then what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ? Church, here's what the word of God tells us. We are all going to have to give an account for our lives to God. Every one of us, myself included, we're all going to have to give an account to God for our lives. Romans 14 is giving us a small glimpse of our future here. He's speaking to Christians when he says, we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And that's important. And I'm going to explain that to you here. We're going to look at this. The judgment seat of Christ, this is only for Christians. Those who do not believe in Jesus, those who do not follow Christ, this is not for them. The judgment seat of Christ is only for for Christians. Do we understand this? Is this clear? In context of Romans 14, I want to make sure that we all understand this. Because many people have questions. What is it going to be like? What's going to be like on the day of the Lord? What, what does the Bible tell us about judgment day? What's, what is that going to be like? Well, I'm, I'm going to give you some understanding from the scripture because Paul is addressing this in Romans 14, so we need to look at this. We need to understand this. For the ungodly and the sinner, for both the wicked and those who never repent and follow Christ as Lord and Savior, they face a different judgment. They have a different judgment. But for us in Christ, we will face the judgment seat of Christ. You know, we hear that, that terminology, and we think, wow, that's heavy. Absolutely it is, because we're going to be facing Jesus. But it's also blessed for us. It's also going to be probably one of the most wonderful days of our life. The Bible speaks of different judgments at the end of the age. First of all, there's going to be three phases of judgment. Satan will be judged. Satan and all the demonic realm will be judged. The Bible tells us that we, as Christians, that we will judge angels, right? The lake of fire was made specifically for Satan and all the fallen angels, all the demonic realm. And on the day of the second coming of Jesus Christ, Satan as author and creator of sin, will be judged. He'll be judged twice. Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3 says this, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. So the devil is going to be put in the bottomless pit, in a prison, for a thousand years. And it says, And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So the Bible is speaking of there's going to come an age where the devil will be imprisoned for a thousand years and he will not be able to tempt the nations for that time period. You know, we, we look at this and just so many questions will arise because we know that 
the greatest part of this is that God returns. Jesus returns. And Satan is set aside for a thousand years. Verse 7 of Revelation 20. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. Then they went up on the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, Jerusalem, and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Satan, the beast, which is the same beast who forces all of mankind who do not follow Christ to take the mark of the beast, and the false prophet, the false trinity. Just as we have Father, Son, Holy Spirit, What's the devil going to do? He's going to create his own false trinity. And they all are going to be destroyed. Satan, the beast, and the false prophet. The false prophet is going to do miracles or signs or wonders. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. So this false beast, or this false prophet rather, is going to try and be to deceive the nations and will be like the Holy Spirit, so to speak, interesting. The beast is going to be like Jesus, and he's going to force people who do not follow Christ to take the mark of the beast. The Bible tells us the number, number of man, 666. And then, of course, the devil himself, because he wants to be like God. He's always wanted to be like God. The devil wants to be worshipped like God. He's an angel. He's not God. He's not a God. He's a created being. He's just so crafty. He's good at deception. He's that used car salesman that can sell you a, a piece of junk. Right? Get a used car salesman that's good at selling you things. Make you buy things that you'd never want. Afterwards, you're going, what did I do? How did I buy this? Got buyer's remorse. So that's the first phase of judgment. Second phase is the great white throne judgment. And this is the judgment that will be for all those who are ungodly and do not repent, who are unwilling to repent and who hate God. I want to make this clear. If you hate God, this is the end for all those who are unwilling to repent, who are unwilling to come to God, who hate God, who do not believe. Jude 1, 14 through 15 says this, Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. Praise God to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and all of the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting what what Jude, the truth that, that the book of Jude explains to us? To convict all who are ungodly of their ungodly deeds done an ungodly way, which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. No one truly escapes justice or the judgment of God. Humanity will either find mercy in Jesus Christ as their Savior, or they will face the full judgment of Almighty God because of their unbelief. You know, this is why Psalm 1.5 says, Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Let me read you here what Revelation 20, let me finish this, 11 through 15, describes it this way. It says, Then I saw a great white throne, 
and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. Who is that? It's Father God. That's God. Whose face the earth and heaven fled away from. Maybe that will be the finality of this earth and the universe, because the Bible tells us there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Not, not heaven as in where God's throne is, but heaven as in the universe, space, planets, heavenly bodies. And it says, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged. Why death and Hades? Because these are all those who have died outside of Christ. Where, where do people who do not, who hate God, what happens to them when they die? The Bible says they go to hell. Do you see that? Right? We, we, we tracking? And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades, look at this. Death and Hades, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. What was made for the devil and his angels and for death and for hell will be cast to a world of eternal suffering. The fire will never go out. It'll be a place of just gnashing of teeth, of great regret. Why didn't I believe? Why was I so deceived by my pride? Why did I let my anger, my hate, blind me? Weeping. This is what the Word of God says. It's real. Now for us, as followers of Christ, the judgment seat, let's look at that. 1 John 4, 17-19 says this, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. <laughs> Praise God. The love of God has been perfected among us in this. This is how you know the love of God is working in you. Is that when on the day of judgment, you're going to have boldness. The day of judgment, that's your heart saying, yes, Jesus has returned. Yes. Yes, Lord. Your promises are true. Everything that you said, and I have believed, and I've trusted in you, and I've waited for this day. And the righteous will be glad. And it says, because as he, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love, but we love him because he first loved us. See, this is what the Apostle John was talking about here. He, people were worried about the judgment day because they were misunderstanding. And he's trying to tell us, look, this is how you know the love of God has been made perfect in you, is that you'll be confident in the day, on the judgment day. You're going to be confident because you know that's when the Lord is going to receive you and you're going to come into your reward. Yes, it's going to be awesome, but it's the love of God. So we stand confident, church. Each of us should be confident in God in this. And this is why we need to understand this in our hearts that we need to say, Lord, I'm yours. I follow you. I'm keeping my eyes on you. I'm not looking to myself or the enemy or any of those. I'm looking to you, Lord. And if I do get sidetracked, I'm coming back to you. I'm putting my eyes on you. 
Can I get an amen from someone? How can we be confident of this? Well, first, as a believer in Christ, I want you to understand this. You were already judged when Jesus Christ was on the cross. And all the sin of the world was laid upon him. That's when judgment day happened for Christians. Because our right standing isn't because of us. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. But it's faith in Christ Jesus that we have right standing with God. Amen? Is this not what the word of God says? See, it's the, the, when we understand the truth of God's word, that sh- this should change us. The reality of the goodness of God, but also the severity of who God is and what, what is going to happen in the earth. And this is why we should be bold about communicating the gospel to others. Because we want everybody to partake of the judgment seat of Christ. Now let me read this to you. I want, I want to give you more context. Jesus said in John 3.18, He who believes in him is not condemned. You see that? Can I get that on the screen there? John 3.36. I'm sorry, 3.18. 3.18. He who believes in him is not condemned. There we go. But he who does not believe is condemned already. How are you condemned? By not believing. By not believing. What does that mean? It's faith. When we don't have faith in Jesus, we don't have faith in what God has done, that Jesus has died for us, that's why we would be condemned. But if you believe you're following Jesus, you're not going to be condemned. This is what Jesus says. Do we believe that? But he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John 3.36 says this, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So it comes back to the importance of understanding it's faith. It's faith. That's why the devil doesn't want you to have faith. That's why the enemy wants to rob you of your faith. So you won't believe. Besides that, there's no relationship with God when you don't believe. And that's why we need to keep hearing the word of God, church. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So we need to keep hearing the word of God. So our faith comes. Because you could be having a great day in faith and then something comes and knocks your feet out from under you. So we got to go back to the word of God. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So we're strengthened in our faith so that way we can hold up that shield of faith. Because those fiery darts are going to come at us. But the Bible says that faith quenches those fiery darts. So how are you going to be able to quench those fiery darts? By faith. It's by hearing the word of God. So when we don't hear the word of God, we suffer. And we're condemned by our own hearts. 1 Corinthians 11, 31 through 32. We just experience this in communion. If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we're chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. This is the truth of God's word. This is why we need to know this. We need to know this. We need to know what's coming. We need to know. You need to be able to know that when the day of the Lord comes, it's blessing for you. It's reward for you. It's not judgment. What will the judgment seat of Christ look like for us? Theologically, it's called the Bema seat. The term judgment seat of Christ was used because the readers of this time understood, they understood the athletic games of ancient Greece. The judgment seat 
was where the judge rewarded the winner of the games they competed in. That's the judgment seat of Christ. It's not condemnation, church. It's reward. It's you, you completed the race. And you know who's at the end of the race? King Jesus. The judgment seat. And he's going to say to you, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. You know, and I believe that in that moment, it's going to seem like it's all about you. Your brothers and sisters of Christ, the, the, for thousands and thousands of years, they're going to see you and they're going to be cheering you on. And it's going to be like something greater than the Olympic Games. Because they'll, be, they'll say, yes, you did it! Just as they have done it. Because God, God can do these things. It's, an, it's amazing, but he's going to stand before you. All the angels celebrating. And he's going to say to you, well done. Good and faithful servant. You believed me. You didn't give up. You stayed faithful when everything was coming at you to make you not believe. And you trusted my word. You believed what I said. And you didn't give up hope. And you encouraged others. You encouraged your brothers and sisters to do the same. Well done. Well done. Good. Faithful. Servant. That's the judgment seat. The understanding for us is this is not where you will be judged, but where you will receive your reward because you were already judged at the cross. When Jesus took all of our sin, that's where judgment happened for the Christian. Now, our works will be tested by fire. What a Christian does in this life will be tested by God. We will give account of what we did for him in this life. If our works were for the kingdom of God, that's gold, that's silver, that's precious stones, they'll endure. And the Bible says we will be rewarded based on that. You can also relate what Jesus says about the parable of the talents. It's, it's very similar. If our works were earthly, they will be consumed. But the Bible tells us yet our crown of salvation will remain. So the test of the fire isn't necessarily about our salvation. That's done. That's resolved. That's secured. That's secured. Let me show you what I mean. 1 Corinthians 3, 12 through 15, it says, Now if anyone builds on this foundation of gold, silver, with gold, silver, and precious stones, what foundation? Jesus Christ. That's salvation. Right? So that if our foundation is Jesus, you're saved. Man who built his house upon the rock, He's saved. The storms come, he's saved. He's still standing. That's you in Christ. But it says here, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day, in other words, the judgment day, the day of the Lord, will declare it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But here's important right here. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. We're not talking about salvation here in this instance. This is going to be God is going to put our lives, what we did with our lives, to the test of fire. What are you building your foundation of Jesus Christ. What are you adding to that? Is it gold? Is it silver? Is it precious stones? Is it the things of the kingdom? It's not, not, that's not talking about money here. The money is the wood and the hay and the stubble. Now he's talking about what, what's gold to God? The things of the kingdom. Fellowshipping with God, fellowshipping with your, your brothers and sisters, doing these things, advancing the kingdom, doing the, the, the work of what Jesus told us to do, to go into all the world, to make disciples, to live for him, to, to seek his face, to do what he said to do. 
That's the gold. That's the silver. That's the precious stones. But he says, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. And the Bible describes many rewards for God's children. Matthew 25, 21 through 23 says, The Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And it says, He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. And his Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. And more specifically, the Bible calls our reward our crown. The Bible calls it the crown of life, calls it the crown of, of, uh, of glory, the crown of rejoicing, the crown of righteousness. We look at uh, Revelation 4, the 24 elders who sit around God's throne all had crowns of gold, and that's where the example of where they cast the, count, the crowns to the ground when the four living creatures worship the Lord. And Jesus talks about the prophet's reward and the reward of the righteous man in Matthew 10. So we understand that there are going to be many rewards in addition to the crown of salvation. This is why the Bible tells us he who comes to God must believe that he is and he's the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's how good God is. He says, not only am I going to save you, but I'm going to reward you for obeying me. Right? Not that we're seeking him for the reward, but there will be reward that we can look forward to. Does that make sense? Right? There's reward coming for you in Christ. That's why we can endure the things that we go through in this life, knowing that there's something far greater. There's a far greater reward coming. There's something far better than this life can ever offer. In light of this, the Bible teaches this perspective. Don't do anything that causes your brother or sister in Christ to fall or stumble. This is the context of what Paul is saying here in Romans 14. He reminds us of what's coming to relate the importance of how we should not do anything to cause our brothers and sisters to stumble, to be against one another but rather to be unified, to be walking together. Jesus says in Revelation 3.11, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. So we're going to answer for our own actions. This is written to us. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not to use this word and say, this is good for somebody else. Oh, I wish somebody else was here today. I wish they would have been here to hear this word. No. It's for us. This is where we need to say, Lord, I need to hear this word. Lord, I need to let this word be a reminder in my heart. That I need to chew on this. That, that Lord, I need to, after church is over today, I need to be chewing on this. Tonight, I need to be chewing on this and thinking about this. Tomorrow, I need to be chewing on this and thinking about this. Throughout this week, I need to be thinking about this. I need to go on, watch on YouTube or Facebook or whatever and, and hear it again because I need to get this in my heart. I need to go to the scriptures. I need to go to the word of God. I need to look at Romans 14, 10 through 12 and, and meditate on this. I need to go look at Revelation 20 and see what the word of God says about these things. I need to understand this. Lord, this has to become a part of my life because this is my future. As a, as a preacher, as a teacher, the Bible tells me, James 3, 1, I'm held to a stricter judgment. I have to teach you according to the word of God. Sure, I would love to just talk to you about fun things and happy things and all of that, and which those are fine, but I need to give you the truth in love. Because this is how our faith grows. This is how we know that our crown is secure. No one will ever take our crown from us. Because we're following, our eyes are following Jesus. And I'm saying to you, follow me as I follow Jesus. 
because I'm following Jesus just like you are. And I have to follow him according to his word just like you do. So join with me in that. And the things that you hear me say and do, right? you do those things as well. According to the grace of God. It's not because of me. It's just I, God has put me here, yes, as the pastor. The government, the spiritual government rests, yeah, amen, I, I, I'm, I'm in that. But I'm your brother. I'm following Jesus. And I want you to follow Jesus with me. And just as you're following Jesus, that's how I'm following Jesus. Amen? We have enough enemies in the kingdom of darkness. We in the church should never be enemies. Only allies. Only family. Amen? It means make it a high priority to look out for one another. Don't look for ways to cause somebody else to stumble or take advantage to your benefit. Consider that there's an importance in the body of Christ winning your brother. Matthew 18, 15, Jesus, when he's talking about people who are in disagreement, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, he says you've gained your brother. The Bible says you've won that person back. That's how we always are to be walking in unity, fellowship, family. Jesus doesn't want any of his flock to be lost, especially because of something that we might do to trip each other up. Let us judge ourselves today and continually considering the reward that waits us in eternity. Close your Bibles, church. Want us to consider here as we close what the Word of God is teaching us. If there's anybody here that wants prayer, that the Spirit of God has been speaking to, I want to pray for you. I want you to come on up. If that's you, if, that's, if you, you've heard this word and you acknowledge as the band comes up and you acknowledge what the word of God is saying here. Maybe you've been judging your brother. Maybe you've been struggling and following Jesus and you've heard what Jesus is saying to us. I want to pray with you. I want to encourage you in God. We'll have others here, other leaders as well, to pray for you. But here's your opportunity. You've heard the word of God. You've heard the message of God. And if you say, I'm not confident in the day of judgment. I'm not confident that I know that Jesus would say to me, well done, good and faithful. But I believe in Jesus. Well, in the light of eternity, in the light of the truth of the word of God, which I've given you today, I want to invite you to come on up to say, Lord, I commit all of my ways to you. I've been giving you some of my ways, but I acknowledge I have to give you everything. As a Christian, your life is going to be put to the test of fire when you stand before God. Yes, you'll be saved. You will have your crown. But are you building your life with wood and hay and stubble? Are you, are you certain that you're building with gold and silver? precious stones are you are you is is Christ everything that you're pursuing and chasing after well if you are then praise God but if you acknowledge Lord there's a lot of wood there's a lot of hay in my life 
There's a lot of stubble, and I know when it comes to the tests of the fire, that's just going to be burned up. And Jesus is saying today, there's something greater that's available for you if you're willing in him. Maybe you are, you know you're guilty of talking about your brother and sister. you're criticizing and the spirit of God has brought conviction upon your heart and you're saying Lord I need to let that go whatever it might be would you all stand in this moment if that's you and you acknowledge just stand lift your hands to the living God and we're going to pray Lord you see all of us you see us all right here our hearts bared open before you. Lord, remove, remove those things, the, the wood, the hay, the stubble, the things that are not eternal. But Lord, in us, the things of your kingdom, the gold, the silver, the precious stones, those things that will endure the fire, the things that become stronger in the fire, in the holy fire of God. Lord, let these things grow in us, the things of your kingdom, the, the sharing the gospel with others, with my family, with my loved ones, with those around me, with making disciples, with helping to share the good news and strengthen my brothers and sisters in you, Lord God, where you're my purpose for living every day. You're not just the one that I come to when I find myself in trouble or in sorrows, but Lord, you're the one that I realize that I can't live this life without you. Lord, that's us. So God, by the power of the Holy Spirit working right now, Lord, let this just be loosened upon us. In the name of Jesus, just a grace right now over each one whose hands are lifted to you in faith, Lord God, who's believing you by the power of the Holy Spirit, just a grace upon each one, Lord God, to deny ourselves and to live for you every day. In Jesus' name, and if you agree, say amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Well, church, let us pursue the things of God. God wants to do a great thing in this city, but it's going to involve each of us. That's why he's called all of us here to do our part, the gift that he has given you. I'm going to be talking a little bit more about this as we come to New Year's Day, Christmas is upon us, and we're going to celebrate that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, and the wonderful, the, the good news of why we celebrate Christmas, and we've got the Aaron Borgos coming next Sunday, but New Year's Day, New Year's service, we're going to talk more about what God has called us to do in this Right, so let's be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, church. Amen. Amen. We're going to have Christmas Eve service. It's going to be on a Sunday, or Saturday, excuse me. Sunday is Christmas Day. We won't have service that day. We won't meet that day. Because I want all of us as a family to be together as families. But Saturday, we'll come together as the family of God. The 24th, the 25th, we won't have church that day. But we will have church the following Sunday which is going to be New Year's Day. And I'll share more about this, church, what God is showing us here in the city of Orange and what he's wanting us to do. Amen? Can you believe with us in that, what God is wanting to do? Praise God. Lord, bless your people. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy, Lord God. Thank you for my brothers and sisters. Thank you, Lord God, that you are the God who provides for this house and for every one of your, of your people, your sons and daughters. We bless you. We honor you. We magnify you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you listen to Becky for just a moment before you leave?
um, announcements. Are you going to do those? So we have prayer this Tuesday night. And next Saturday, we have Christmas decorating at 9.30. It should only take us two hours if we have enough people here. So if you please come and help me, I'd really appreciate it. And that's December 10th, this coming Saturday. There it is on the screen. Um, prayer this Tuesday. Was there anything else? Thursday Bible study. We have Thursday Bible study. That's at 10. Okay. I just wanted to say thank you all for coming out this last Thursday night. Did you guys feel the power of God? I felt the presence of the Lord there. It was awesome. Thank you all for helping, for coming together as a family, for bringing food, for welcoming everybody who's a visitor. It was really awesome. I have, uh, I have a really good friend of mine who said that he really felt the presence of God. He, he didn't understand what it was, but he felt, he felt something. And so God is really talking to him. And so, you know, we're praying for salvation. So so God is talking to him. And so I'm really, really grateful for that. And uh, there's a lot of others that also said they really felt the presence of the Lord. So that was, it was really awesome. So thank you all. Thank you all for, for coming and everything. And then also, I just want to say happy anniversary to Pastor Gabe and Susan. Everybody, if you guys can say happy anniversary. 30. Woo! That's awesome. That's awesome. All right. God bless you all. Amen.